Welcome to the Week of Evolution webinar series. We, as well as the University Science Club, Tree of Evolution Committee, collaborated with many scientists who are the experts in their fields to present an evolution themed series for you. We wanted to use the opportunities of the online platform to meet with professors all around the world. Our mission was always to support accurate scientific information and create platforms where science can be freely discussed and told. And when the conditions present in our country are taken into account, it is even more important and crucial to do so. Uh, therefore, we would like to rest restate the necessity for free academy, as we still protest and stand against the appointed rectors and their undue sanctions. Both university members have been standing against this anti-democratic situation for more than a year. Mm, aside from that, this year we will have planners between 31st of January and 7th of February. You can also follow our social media accounts to be posted about the calendar. Today we will welcome Professor Marta Glocki and after she, um, she, she is finished with his, her talks, we will have a short question and an answer session. You can ask the questions through chat and our team We'll edit and direct them to our professor. Welcome again, Professor Marta uh, Klocki. Thank you. Hey. Now so, we can um, see your screen and we can also see you too. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's um, it's a, I think it's a really important audience to talk to and I'm very happy to share my insights of evolution when it comes to bacteriophages. So hopefully in the next uh, half hour or so, I want to share with you uh, my, my various insights and why I think we can consider the evolution of phages to be in this cloud format and why I think that's really important to study the evolution of these organisms. So the structure of my talk I have here, in case anybody is um, a little bit uh, drift, drifts away, you can easily come back and follow the structure of my talk as I go along. So I'll introduce you first of all to bacteriophages. And then I thought it was important to tell you what we know about evolution and what phages have taught us already. I'll talk about the different phases of viruses and phages um, and what phages do in nature. I will talk about a little bit about their host range, their genome evolution. Um, I want to present to you an ecological framework that I think is important to look at them. And I'll end by telling you why I think this is such an important area and, and going forward, what should be the next steps. So I thought it was important, first of all, just to show us, <laughs> to show you what phages are. So a phage is a bacteria eater. So it's a virus that specifically infects the bacteria. And they are the most abundant entity on Earth. And I love this picture here. Can you still hear me okay in, in the talk? Yes, everything is perfect right okay. now. Perfect, great, thank you. So um, if you look at this um, this picture, what you can see is actually just seawater that's been stained with a cyber green stain. So this stain stains DNA. And um, if you look at the big things, they're all bacteria. And all these little things can you see around them, they're all bacteriophages. So they're incredibly, um, I, I love this as seawater, as I said, but if you look anywhere in any bacterially dominated place, so your lungs, your guts, the puddles outside your building, where you find bacteria, you will find all these bacteriophages uh, controlling many aspects, which I'll tell you about in a minute, of the bacteria themselves. So they're extremely, extremely abundant. It's estimated that there's 10 to the 31 of these things on Earth. And if you look at the right side of my diagram, th these are the four things. If you just want to remember four things about phages after my talk, these are the four things you can remember. They're the most abundant organisms. So if you line them up head to tail, you can see that's the heads, that's the tails. They would stretch a staggering 200 mi million light years path away. <laughs> so that's, that takes you from the Earth right past the Andromeda galaxy and out to the edge of the visible universe. OK, so there it's a, it's a staggering 10 to the sum, but 10 to the 31 is a really hard number to, to get your head around. but as I say, it's huge. Um, not only are there a lot of them, they're also uh, very, very genetically diverse. So you can find incredibly uh, new bacteriophages quite easily. I'm still regularly finding viruses where I can't recognize any gene. 
So if you think about with bacteria, you can always recognize some of the key genes that, that control the metabolism. With phages, they're so diverse, often you just don't know what anything is. So they represent this whole new treasure trove of organisms, particularly when it comes to trying to find things that kill bacteria. The fact that they do this anyway is, is, uh, you can, um, is very useful to us. So they have a long history of being used, uh, particularly in therapy in certain parts of the world, Russia and Georgia. And they can be very useful to us in terms of uh, actually finding new ways to kill bacteria that are, are resistant to antibiotics. OK, so this is in a way motivated this, this need to find new antimicrobials in a way has motivated a, a resurgence of interest in bacteriophages. So this is what they look like. You can see they have a, a little uh, a protein head and then a, a protein case in general. And then they have a genome inside the head, which gets transferred through that head into the bacterial cell. Now, when they infect, that bacteria is no longer bacteria anymore. It's a, it's a, we call it a virus cell because it's being completely reprogrammed. So the, the phage will say, nope, you're not a bacteria anymore. You're a phage. Make me. So it takes over and that bacteria will release about up to 100, perhaps even more bacteriophages, which will then be released and they'll go and find another bacterial cell. So they're really, really, really specific. And we'll talk a bit more about that specificity later. But in general, they're very often specific to species or genus. OK, let's have a little look more about some actual bacteriophages rather than just a little picture. Uh, so these are a bunch of bacteriophages. One of my students isolated recently from uh, bacteria associated with the insides of, of animals. Now we can see, can you see this? They're quite beautiful different shapes. These are called myoviruses. These have got contractile tails that, uh, that, that when they find their bacterial host, this, the, this sheath contracts and the DNA is put into the bacterial cell. We have other ones called uh, cyphoviruses. They essentially stab their hosts with these long non-contractile tails. And these little ones here, can you see, these are podoviruses. So they've got podo just means foot. So these, these guys just often they have quite clever ways of dissolving the outside of bacteria to get in. Now, the reason I put a picture of myself here and a bacteria is I wanted to remember to make the point to you that I have more in common with that bacterial cell. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite bacteria, Clostridium difficile. I'm more related to that Clostridium difficile than that virus is to that virus. OK, so that's how different they can be to each other. Not only do they, and they look a little bit similar, but they're very, very nothing in common genetically at all. OK. So the different parts of a virus we need to think about are this, as I said, this infected part, the infected virus cell, or the free part. So here's um, another shape, actually. I thought you might enjoy looking at this one. It's one of my undergraduates isolated this virus last year. So again, it's got that long, and um, that's the protein coat with its little legs, and the DNA genome is in there. So when it's just as a capsid, we call that the free stage or the passive phage. Uh, when it's infecting a bacterial cell, what you're seeing here is actually um, it's a principal component analysis of two sets of of metabolites. So all so it sounds much more complicated than I mean it to be actually. All, all essentially what I'm saying is when a phage takes over bacteria, it makes it make a whole bunch of different compounds. As I said, because it's saying make me make me I'm a phage. But uh, different phages when they take over the same bacterial cell will take it over differently. Okay, so so that's sort of representing this this active stage, and I'll, I'll talk more about both of these aspects uh, as as we go through the talk. But essentially, when a virus is infected with bacteria, it is this virocell. Okay, so it's a metabolically active bacteria that's not doing much else other than making phages. So it's interesting the um the functions of this coat of this virion. It's got to protect that delicate DNA from the outside world. And it's got to recognize a suitable host. And that recognition happens through those tail fibers. And when that's recognized, the DNA is given from the head of the virus into that bacterial cell. OK, so actually, it's interesting, really, this this capsid um, has uh, has sort of contradictory requirements, really, because the <laughs> the, te the protection of that genome has got to be are very stable to stop the nucleic acid being uh, damaged by the outside environment. And then it's got to totally rearrange itself with completely very significant amounts of uh, what's known as Gibbs free energy, triggered by very subtle interactions of that phage with its host molecule, or its host, or the molecule on the bacterial cell. 
So you can see that this this protective coat of the Virion, it's a sort of it's a very elegant and it's still there's still many um, people working on different aspects of the different variants because I've just shown you a snapshot and you can see they're quite different shapes. So it's it's thought to be this this compromise between being ultra stable and ultra good at injecting. But <laughs> as there's more phages than anything else, you can see it's a very, very successful thing. So when were phages discovered and who by? Well, they were discovered just over 100 years ago, first of all, by an Englishman here called Frederick Tort. Now, he um, he wasn't looking for them, but he noticed these little glassy colonies on his bacteria and he realized he could pick them off and they would kill other bacteria. So he uh, he wrote this and researched it extensively. He wrote about it in The Lancet, but sadly he got involved in the war and his scientific career in this area was curtailed. They were also discovered um, independently two years later by somebody called Felix Terrell. He was a rather maverick French Canadian who was working in the Pasteur Institute in France in Paris. And he discovered them and he immediately uh, after discovering them, realized that they would be useful. He realized they killed bacteria, and he knew then that bacteria kill us. So he started doing studies straight away to kill a bacteria that caused enteric diseases and skin diseases, gangrene, and so on. So he often is accredited as being the father of phages because he was able to, to do um, a lot of experiments straight away after. Now he then actually went on and trained somebody called George Eliava, who started the Bacteriophage Institute in Georgia, which is often people, when they think of phages, if you know something about them, you think, oh, they're Georgian or Russian. And that's because he trained that chap and then they, he then started this institute uh, in Georgia. So just over 100 years, but of course, they're much, much, much older. Now, it's difficult to delve deep into the evolutionary time of these things, but it's thought that if we look at the history of Earth, um, that bacteria are about 3.9 billion years old. So here we have on the right side, this is a, a this is a little schematic showing you when the Earth is thought to have formed, so 4.6 billion years ago. And life got going quite early on. And it's thought that phages are as early as bacteria. So most of the time of the evolution of the Earth, it's really just been bacteria and phages. You can see plants and animals didn't get going until much, 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 much later. Um, the cyanobacteria are interesting, aren't they? Here, they, they they oxygenated the planet and actually made it accessible to plants and animals by providing enough oxygen for them to then evolve. So cyanobacteria phages, we'll again return to it a little bit. They are, they're really fascinating in themselves. This is how I fell in love with the subject 20 years ago, actually, was through studying the cyanobacteria and their phages. But essentially, I just want to make the point here that they've been together for a very, very, very long time. And as we've created new niches, the phages and the bacteria have evolved to fill them. Right, so now we're moving on to talk about this next point, which is what phages have taught us about evolution. So I thought it's important to share with you here, <laughs> given that it's an evolution week, um, the different things that you might not realize actually phages taught us. So what's the first thing? Well, they actually taught us that the very nature of genetic material, the fact that the heritable uh, ingredient is DNA came from studies of phages. So I particularly like these experiments because it was another Martha, Martha Chase and Alfred Hershey. And in 1950, they did these very elegant experiments where they took viruses, phages, so I do use phage and virus interchangeably. They took these phages and they labeled in some sets the protein with sulfur, or radioactive sulfur, and other experiments, they labeled the DNA with radioactive phosphorus. They then showed <laughs> that if you infect with um, with just the, they, they then basically stuck these things into the blender and they showed that in the viruses that had labeled sulfur, they could see that they were all over the cell. They stuck to the edge of the cell and they injected their DNA, but they could see that that sulfur never made it into that bacterial cell. However, if they did the same experiments post blender. They could see that the, uh, the, radioactively labeled phosphorus had made it into the bacterial cell and the phages therefore um, they, they could show that the phages took over that bacterial cell and made more bacteria phages okay so they re then realized that it wasn't the protein that was uh, <laughs> was encoding for this information it was in fact the dna so this is a really really key experiment to show us what the nature of the genetic heritable mach machinery was 
the next set of experiments um, was some really interesting um, experiments that showed us that uh, bacteria really follow Darwinian evolution. So Darwin had made his theories based on studying things like finches, hadn't he famously, the, the finches of the Galapagos Islands, and, and large species that he'd studied, and he saw that made this correlation between things like a beak, particular beak morphology and diet of the birds, and he proposed that there'd been a selective advantage on those birds that could eat that particular feed. But the problem with those experiments is they take a long, long, long time to do. Whereas phages and bacteria, you can evolve together and you can look for phenotypes straight away. So Luria and Delbrook had these interesting ideas that they were saying, well, if I grow bacteria with phages, if something is happening to cause mutations in the, in the, from the media that I'm growing them on, we'd see this like in situation A, we'd see an equal number always of mutations in bacteria in terms of, um, they looked at mutations in terms of bacterial resistance to viruses. They said, however, if the viruses themselves are driving evolution, then we will see different populations being resistant uh, at, at different times, and we'll see a much more variable rate of mutation. So that was his idea. And apparently he got this idea about watching um, a slot machine at a dance, a university dance. So it's interesting. You might think you're wasting your time having fun with your friends, but no, you could be coming up with interesting ideas of experiments. And um, he showed that B happened. So he was able to say really that yes, or they were able to say that actually Darwin's principles, not Lamarckian principles, are correct when it comes to evolution. So um, Luria, Delbrook and um, uh, Hershey, they actually all got the Nobel Prize in 1969 for these studies on bacteriophages and the relevance to evolution. I'd like to zoom forward now a little bit more and consider CRISPR editing. So I'm sure you've all heard of CRISPR editing. It stands for Clustered Regularly, uh, regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, essentially little bits of repeated DNA which can be used to very, very accurately guide genetic engineering principles. So I'm not going to go into the details here and now. I just want to make the point that what these area, these little areas of repeated um, sequences come from is that relationship between phages and bacteria. So phages cleverly uh, have little arrays of these um, of, of little repeats. And if they infect bacteria and they've that bacteria has experienced that phage attack, it'll recognize the array in the phage and it'll immediately chop it up. So we can redirect the system to engineer whatever we like. Um, so there are moral, uh, so, 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 some things that you, you, you've perhaps seen in terms of ethics are slightly questionable, but essentially it does allow us to very, to make mutants in, in really nearly anything in a very clean, quick and precise way. So it's a very, very useful tool if used correctly. So the people that discover that, so again, two very good female scientists, uh, Emmanuel Doudna and um, Jennifer Charpentier, and they also got the Nobel Prize in 2020 for this discovery. So these are just three examples of really key things that we've learned about evolution from studying phages. Right. So the next thing I want to tell you about is what are all these phages doing? Um, <laughs> uh, how, how are they interacting um, and where? So they have two major life cycles. The first one is shown here where they infect and kill. That's called the lytic life cycle. Okay, so that's where they just go in and they kill. So in terms of therapy, this is the cycle we're interested in. But this lysogenic cycle is the name of the other most common one where they, they go in and they don't just kill, they integrate. So I could give you a whole uh, lecture series just on this topic as to why phages would want to do this. But essentially the advantage of becoming lysogenic and integrating is that you're safe, aren't you? You're inside a bacterial cell, so you don't have to worry about the environment getting you because every time that bacteria divides, yes, you only get one copy made, but you keep being maintained. And actually, when I started working on phages about 20 years ago, it was that's when people started sequencing bacterial genomes and they realized, oh, that Haemophilus genome has got phages in it. Oh, so is that strep, so is that, <laughs> uh, so is that Clostridium. And it was really one of the reasons we realized how dominant and abundant phages were, were that every bacteria that was sequenced was realized that they had phages inside them. And the other thing that made us realize how important phages might be was actually just looking at them. So do you remember I showed you this figure earlier on? People started looking in natural ecosystems and they saw, oh gosh, this thing is full of, uh, this, sets, this ecosystem is full of phages as well. So as I said, it's estimated there's about 10 to 100 phages for every bacterial cell in existence, leading to this number of 10 to 31 globally. 
And that is also calculated that there's 10 to 31 phage infections per second globally. So hopefully, if you remember something from this talk, you'll realise that, that phages are not little side players. They're really driving bacteria by this vast amount of infection. And then we, although we study this cat, this little free phase quite often, what we're really interested in seeing is what, what are they doing when they're actually infecting um, and during this, this um, infective period? And it's important to say as well that the bacteria don't just take it, they're full of defense strategies. They don't necessarily want to be infected. So um, on this slide, I'm really sharing with you now the types of things that they do. One thing is that they infect the, they affect the population dynamics. So if you have lots of species of bacteria growing together, let's take, what should we take? Let's, let's take a lung, a lung of somebody who's got cystic fibrosis and they've got pseudomonas infections in there. So they have different strains of pseudomonas and these will be differentially sensitive to phages, which are just naturally there anyway. And depending on which phages can access, you have a different composition of bacteria that are left over. So you see this in lungs, you see this in the ocean, you see it in everywhere. So the phages are trimming every, trimming the population dynamics. Now when they infect cells, they obviously break them open, they release stuff, which also has a knock-on effect on the rest of the ecosystem. And then when they're infecting, they can encode toxins, more on that in a slide in a moment, and they can also impact evolution by horizontal gene transfer. Okay, because sometimes they can shove their head full of DNA that's not theirs, and they can dump it into another host in a non-harmful way. So if you get rid of phages, you get rid of a whole way that bacteria have to evolve. I'm just going to show you now a little bit about how bacteria fight back. They fight back in every possible way. So the phage infects its DNA, and the um, <laughs> the the bacteria can, can, can try to in, interfere with that process, can interfere with adsorption, it can chop that DNA up, or it can just kill itself. Okay, there's something called abortive infection or toxin antitoxin system. Um, and they can also interfere with the um, assembly of that bacterial phage genome. So in, in the same way that you can see bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics, they can become resistant to phages. And I love this slide here because it's showing you and you see here, this is where a lot of the battle happens on that surface receptor. So the bacteria can throw out little decoys, it can modify the receptor, uh, it can glycosylate it, it can just cover it in, in, in sort of yucky, mucusy stuff so that the phage can't infect it. It can modify that protein in different ways, or it can regulate its expression. Okay, so the, uh, the bacteria in general are coming up with strategies then to stop infection and the phage are coming up with counter strategies. So what are phages doing? Well, they are doing all sorts of things. So some of the, when they're in that lysogenic state, they have to encode something that makes that host maintain them, that bacterial host maintain them. And actually this has meant that some of the most toxic poisons we know, so for example, in E. coli, the bacteria that causes um, hemorrhagic uh, blood poisoning, the version of E. coli that does that, that toxin is not encoded by a bacteria, it's encoded by a phage. They might encode um, antibiotic resistance. This has been shown for MRSA, which stands for methicillin resistance, Staphylococcus aureus. Methicillin resistance is actually can be encoded in the phage. Um, and, and then you've got toxins, really um, well-known toxins like the uh, botulinum and diphtheria toxin are phage encoded. So they can, can, they can encode those. So obviously later on when we talk about using phages, we would not use any phages capable of integrating and therefore doing that. But it's interesting to realise that a lot of the physiology of bacteria as we know it is from the things that the phages are encoding. And you can have multiple phages. It's really fascinating that you can have E. coli with perhaps 20 phages and they're all doing different things to the physiology of that cell. So there's some great papers out there on things like is our phages um, a useful feature of the bacteria or just a molecular time bomb? Because so any moment they can go off and burst that bacteria open. So I first got interested in phages, as I said, about 20 years ago. And that, what, what interested me was I was trying to work out the diversity of cyanobacteria in the oceans and how they were, who was controlling them. And I started looking at the phages because I could see from those pictures I showed you how abundant they were. When I sequenced the genome of a, of a cyanobacteria phage, I found it was full of, can you see here, this is the genome map. And what I want you to see is that if the genes are red, they are from a, have some similarity to another virus. If they're black, we have no idea what they are. 
and green, these are the fascinating ones, they all come from other bacteria. So the viruses, uh, they sort of, that's challenging our definition of a virus a little bit, isn't it? Because the virus is full of bacterial things. So I told you that the bacteria is full of virus things, and it goes the other way around. The virus has stolen the bacteria things. So these are photosynthesis genes. So the main two photosynthetic proteins inside the backside of bacteria or any other plant are these two proteins, PSBA and D, and the phage is making them. And the reason why it's doing that is because uh, if it didn't, it would, the phage would infect and the bacteria would die and it wouldn't be able to have energy to make more phages. Okay, so they have, so the way phages are evolving um, in many settings is to take things from the house that are useful to them. And I have to show you the next example I want to talk about uh, is a very um, lovely story to illustrate the fact that phages don't just influence the microbial world. So these little aphids, um, they have in them bacteria called Hamiltonia defensa. Now those bacteria have in them phages, and the phages encode for a toxin, and the toxins kill ladybirds. So can you see that's really fascinating, isn't it? You've got, you've got these aphids that are being protected by a phage against their enemy. Um, and this work was all done by somebody called Nancy Moran, who I think she's at Yale still. She was, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure she's at Yale. Anyway, N Nancy Moran is her name. So I find these really interesting because we often, you know, we're thinking, considering these tiny little 100, 200 kilo base organisms infecting microbes, but you can see how they affect all of, um, all of higher life as well. This is just one nice example. So how are phages evolving? Um, what's their host range? Who do they infect? How specific are they? And how do we study them? Okay. So phages evolve by infecting bacteria. And as I said, they make hundreds of phages and the fittest survive. And we can measure the fittest, we can measure the parameters of the phage. So here we have phages on plates. This is where phages kill the bacteria. Um, we can measure to see how aggressively they kill. We can look at the birth size, which is how many they make. You can look at how long it takes to make them. Um, and the aggressiveness is known as the virulence index. This is something we commonly measure all the time. So um, ph phages in general, <laughs> some are more aggressive than others. Uh, some absorb faster. So if they absorb faster and make more phages quicker, they're considered to be fitter. But different phages will have different strategies. Now, some of them are quite specific to um, not even a species, but a subspecies. So what we can see here, can you see that, um, don't worry about the color, just look at the squares. And all I want you to see here, these are the phages along the bottom and strains of Clostridium difficile along uh, the side. And if, it's a, if there's a box, that means it infects. Uh, and if there's not a box, it's just white, it doesn't. So you can see some phages infect just one subspecies <laughs> of all of these strains of Clostridium, whereas others are much more broad range. So when I'm developing my phages to, to try to kill bacteria that I want to kill, I find these quite broad range ones. The next figure I'm showing you is also quite interesting. This has been a recent study that was just published in Nature Communications. And what they showed, this is a whole bunch of species now of staff. And all I want you to see really is if that phage is uh, blue, it shows it's very, very specific to that species. If it's sorry, green, blue, and if it's dark blue, it shows it infects many species. I find this interesting because we often only just test phages on the species we want to kill. Um, but when you go a bit broader, you probably find that some phages are indeed more broad host range. And we can see that with related bacteria. Often we'll see that Shigella phages can be infected by E. coli and so on. Right, now I want to show you a little bit more about the genome evolution of phages. And again, I'm going to take you on about a 20 year journey here as well. So this is a paper which I really love that was written just in uh, 1999. And it was called All the World's a Phage. <laughs> so it's by this very, um, sadly, he's died, he died fairly recently. Um, Roger Hendricks is a brilliant phage biologist. What he did was he took all the phages that had been sequenced at the time when he wrote this paper. So these are the names of the phages in here. And this is what they affect on the outside. And he showed that if they, in fact, um, depending on which genes you look at, you can see different relationships. So, for example, you can see that um, if you look at the head of, uh, of this particular bacteriophage, the head, head of a lambda phage is quite similar to the head of this, um, this other phage here that infects the streptomyces. But if we look at, say, in um, this other gene, 
this one here is <laughs> is more related to, to to that phage. And basically, he showed that the, the relationships between phages were quite mosaic, depending on what genes you looked at. So he sort of proposed that there was no structure in terms of phage evolution, and that through overlapping host ranges, phages had this interesting blur. So they broke all the normal sort of vertical evolution rules. As I said, this was in about 1999. And then pe people's thinking of what was really quite interesting. Um, but then as more and more genomes became available, so this is jumping forward now to 2015, we can see these are all a bunch of phages that infect salmonella. Uh, and we can see there is actually some structure. So these these are dif dif different types of viruses, all infecting that one species. Um, but they within that, there are clusters of related viruses. We've taken this much further recently. This is some work that I've been doing in, in my lab. Um, and we can see these are now each little dot now represents a salmonella phage. And we can see that if you want to address our phages mosaic or is there structure, it does look like there's both. So what we can see, can you see each? Each of these clouds of, is a little um, set of phages that are related to each other. Now, some clouds are related to other clouds. So that cloud here is related to that cloud. Um, and that, that cloud here, again, is related to that cloud. But there are others that are completely unrelated. So we, the way we can think about evolution of phages is that we can think for e each bacteria, there'll be several sets of phages around it. Some of them are related to each other and some are not. Um, so this is one of the things we're spending a lot of time at the moment really trying to do in our lab is then trying to work out, well, what are the features? What makes that cloud phages within there? How effective are they at killing? And can we recognize features within these clouds that actually would be useful to us? So when we then let go and look at another species, can we immediately recognize the sort of types of phages that we might want to study more that might have useful properties? OK, so that sort of takes me to the, to the now, now I can show you this, this framework, actually. So in the same way that other things have evolved to have certain strategies of plants and animals, you have specialists, don't you, and generalists and in most things that evolve. And we see this in phages as well. So some phages will just infect one thing, some will infect many. And we also see this other kind of tendency where some phages just make a few offspring, others make many. Um, but most likely they can also be separated according to other ecological strategies and principles. And I spent quite a lot of time um, in recent years looking at seeing if we can repurpose this plant ecological strategy, which is based on um, dividing things according to how good they are at coping with stress, how good they are at coping with competition, and how good they are at coping with different types of disturbance. We've been seeing um, how this can be applied to bacteriophages. And then what I've been doing is looking at individual phages and then also then seeing how you might combine phages. Because if we want to use phages in a therapeutic setting to kill bad bacteria, we want to make sure we don't use any phages that have got any traits that would lead to a deleterious outcome. So we don't want any that can integrate and follow that lysogenic cycle, for example. We don't want any phages that can even transduce, that can pass genes from one thing to another. So we're looking at different types of phages and different strategies. Now, I'm just going to end now in terms of, of, of going forward. Why, why are we so why do we care so much about this in terms of uh, antimicrobials? Well, I'm sure this will not have escaped any of you. Lots of headlines about superbugs threatening to return us to the dark ages. So the Lancet published a, a study, was it two weeks ago, I think now? It said that um, how many um, people had died in, 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 in 2019. Uh, 1.2 million people worldwide have died from antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And it's estimated that if we don't do anything by 2050, we're going to have 10 million people a year across the globe dying of, um, of these infections. So it will make our COVID deaths shrink into insignificance. So by understanding phages, we actually have a whole new set of, <laughs> of antimicrobials that we can study um, in order to, 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 to progress this. So we... Uh, have a, a second chance and we can start off really in the outset on a good footing. So with antimicrobials, we've already messed up, haven't we? We've overused antibiotics. We've got all sorts of problems. But by understanding how phages evolve and how we can put phages together, we can actually start again. We've got a second chance at saving <laughs> these bacteria um, uh, as the doctors and allowing doctors to be able to treat these resistances. So. I think our knowledge of evolution can really help us identify, engineer and develop these new antimicrobials.
There's a quote here which I really love. Uh, this is um, a very famous journalist who once phoned me. I uh, was just working away, marking some student essays actually. And he phoned me and he was asking all sorts of phrases. He was writing for Newsweek. And I, he's always, I've always loved the way he's written about science over the years. And this quote I, I really enjoyed, which is, there is much we can learn from phages, even though they are nothing more than a scrap of genetic code in a protein overcoat. Um, so that's really what, what we are. And hopefully you've just, I've tried to illustrate in my lecture to you today, just the, the vast scope and the vastness of it all, but we can, each system we work on. So I've been at this a while now, as I said, two decades. And each system I work on, you look at the genomes of these things and you think, oh my goodness, who would have thought it was possible that they can do that? So I almost believe that if you can dream a phage might do something. Uh, and often people who like young, maybe young people or perhaps um, uh, doctors who are interested in something, they might say, could a phage do this? And I'll, I think I think oh actually possibly <laughs> if we study if it had enough might be able to find a page that can do that and would have that feature. So this just summarizes in one slide. This is my penultimate slide. Here I've got a list of all the different species of uh, bacteria that we worked on with different phages. And what I'm doing with my phages, um, as I said in the semester, is first of all we're, we're isolating them, we're building up banks of the um, of the of the of the, of the of their genomics. And really try to um, understand the full diversity within that. And then when we've got the phages, I then try to work out how we might use them. We study um, how they would behave both individually. So treat, for example, a gut infection or a doctor wants to treat a gut infection. It's important that that bacteriophage would work in a way where the, um, there was no oxygen like it would be in the gut. And then we look to see how we could put phages together in different ways, um, because often, as I said, to get that species coverage, you, you need to put more than one phage together. So we look at putting putting them together in those um, in combinations. And we've got lots of different models. We can study phages in artificial guts, in uh, insect models, in biofilms, all these representatives. We've even got things like artificial guts and artificial bladders that we're working with in the lab as well. So the next stage of the work that we're doing is moving on to human trials via animal trials and there's another whole sets of work that, uh, surrounding that. So it really, hopefully, hopefully you can see that all of these more applied things are underpinned by using phages and understanding their, their fundamental biology, their evolution. So just to conclude, um, I've shown you that phages are the natural enemies of bacteria, and it's a pretty exciting time to be studying them, even in terms of um, you know, that, that first genome I showed you. It, it took six months to sequence the genome and cost. I had to write a special grant, it cost uh, £26,000. Now my undergraduate students, when they find an interesting virus, they just sequence it, it costs £50, and they get the data back three days later. So you can see it's really exciting because you can go straight from finding something to getting information, which then allows you to do more experiments. They don't work in the same way as, um, as, as a standard antimicrobial, so we have to understand disease a little bit differently. Um, think about it as, as modelling and modifying the ecology. I think for this audience, for, for you out there, hopefully I've shown you that I think there's a huge amount of potential for research and studying and jobs. <laughs> so uh, with that, I will finish and happily answer any questions you might have in our question and answer session. So thank you for your attention. Um, thank you so much for your brilliant talk, Professor Plucky. Um, it was expectedly really interesting for us. And if it is suitable for you too, we can move on with a short question and answer session. Um, Muge Jansu and Amen will direct the questions from our audience. I think we can start. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, most welcome. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for giving this beautiful presentation. It was a great pleasure to listen. Uh, the first question is, how do the interactions between bacteriophages and microbes affect the ecosystem? Well, they, they affect them in, in different ways. So the first thing is, because they're quite specific, they will, they will modify that species composition. So if you have a um, uh, so, so sort of a community that consists of many different types of the same species, the phages will very often drive the, the the most common thing that the phages can infect. The phages will amplify and they'll knock that particular type down, and then another type will come up. So you see these waves, these predator prey interactions of different phages uh, and different bacteria uh, fo following each other. 
and then so, so you see you see them so that's one way that they really they change very much the species composition and the community composition and then i think uh, very very much key as well as what i was showing you in terms of um when it, many phages can access this lysogenic cycle so they'll therefore because they do things they make the bacteria behave, behave differently which again has that the whole set of infecting it so it's really key i think I, I always think of phages as being like the puppet masters, you know, that, like the bacteria just like, the, like the, the poor innocent things that are corrupted by viruses the whole time and made to do things and change. But then you could also argue that the, phage, the bacteria need those phages in order to uh, to evolve and become something different and new. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, another question is what factors may be involved in the specificity of certain viruses to certain bacteria? Yeah, that's a very, again, a nice question. The, uh, the specificity, uh, the first thing that determines that specificity is, is that interaction between the fibers and the receptors. So uh, all phages, need to get into that bacterial cell and very often it's proteins or lipopolysaccharides or sugars on the surface of the bacteria that determine whether it can get in so that's the first thing and then there's there's also many um ways that uh downstream events as well so the bacteria are really good at sensing those phages and chopping them up or do, doing different things there's loads of there. there's a very nice group actually in israel and like it's almost like every month they find a whole new phage defense system because the, the phage defenses tend to cluster in little islands so uh, what, what people do is they mine to try to understand how different bacteria can fight phages but a lot of it does happen at that very very first level of that being able to um, enter the, the cell And uh, and last question is, if a bacteria that is targeted by a specific phage conjugates, will the same phage be able to uh, target the conjugated bacteria as well? Um, sorry, I didn't quite follow the question. The, the bacteria is conjugated with what? So is it uh, with yeah, a plasma? Uh, I think it means that there are two bacteria and uh, they conjugate, so the uh, DNA-like material is being... Uh, Oh, okay, being exchanged yeah, through a plasmid. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh that's, a, that's a lovely question. I can tell that you're interested in evolutionary <laughs> processes and mechanisms. Yeah. Yeah, there's actually, funnily enough, the, the whole, um, yeah, there is an interplay between phages and plasmids and bacteria. People often don't look at that. People, like, people that study plasmids tend to look at plasmids and phage people suddenly tend to look at phages. But that's a nice question because there is interaction between them. And actually, systems like that CRISPR system that monitors, that, that tends to um, uh, recognize both uh, but it, that'll recognize uh, plasmids and it'll recognize phages as well. And they, you can have things like you can have genes on plasmids that the bacteria that help the bacteria by stopping the bacteria phage in, infecting. Um, so there are there is this interplay actually between the, the different components of um, of the sort of mobile elements associated with bacteria. Okay, thank you very much. All right. So I can send you, I didn't know to the gist of the organizers, I didn't send the slides in advance, but I'll send them retrospectively if you want to circulate them to the audience. <laughs> of course, and I think we should stop here because of the limited time in total. And thank you again, Professor Klocki. We deeply appreciate your contribution to the series. Uh, also, as we are saying goodbye to you, we kindly request the viewers to stay with us if they would like to do the do the uh, prized Kahoot quiz. So, okay. Goodbye. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> bye. bye. Yeah. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye. Um, hey, man, and your baby now, nicely, here's for the Pearson Sunumuyla Igle. Ufak bir kağıt kuzimiz var. Buna katılmak istiyorsanız şu an hemen kuzi başlatalım bence. Sence de. Evet. Zaten bayağı bir vakit geçmiş oldu. 10 soruluk bir kuzi zaten aynen. Bir saniye hemen hazırlıyorum ben. Bir 
Teyze katılımda bir probleminiz olursa da çete yazabilirsiniz bu arada. Bazen internetle alakalı sıkıntılar olabiliyor. <gülüyor> Şu an. Evet. Görebiliriz değil mi? Evet görüyoruz. Oyun içimiz bu. Kavuta girmek için. Linke mi tıklamaları gerekiyor yoksa önce? Oyun piniyle girebilirsiniz ya da kare kodu okutarak girebilirsiniz. Şu an ekranda kahut görünüyor değil mi? Evet evet kahut görünüyor. Sanırım ufak bir sorun var Ece. Oyuncu sınırı niye 3 gözüküyor? Hiçbir fikrim yok. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Bu kalıtı daha sonra yapmayayım düzenlesek. Çünkü baya güzel bir soru var. Baya güzel, hoş sorular hazırlamıştı ekibimiz. O zaman Marta'nın kalıtına geçebiliriz. Ya da... <gülüyor> Hayır, bence um, bu sorunu çözdükten sonra başka bir yayından sonra kalıta devam edelim. Tamam, o zaman. Katıldığınız için hepinize teşekkür ederiz. Yarın Hemrim Haftası'nın devamında görüşmek üzere. Hoşçakalın.